Melbourne have won 17 games in a row, is what was said three weeks ago before they capitulated against the Dockers. At the 23 minute mark of the second quarter, Bailey Fritch converted to give Melbourne a five goal lead. From that point on, they were outscored 81-13 and have since slumped to three consecutive defeats. But why? Here is the reasons behind their losing streak. In order to understand the issues of now, we must look at the symptoms. Lapsing at times in matches which led opponents back into the game, or with a chance. We can observe this through poor second halves, which is translated over to the current issues of their match day performances. For example, they held on against the Hawks after kicking four behinds in the last quarter. Five behinds against the Suns in the last quarter, but held on. And then against Richmond, only scored nine points, but due to a good defensive performance, ended up winning that game too. Nonetheless, it is mystifying how Melbourne have dropped off so badly. To visualize this, let's take a look at a statistic posted by Twitter stats guru, Swamp. Melbourne after halftime in 2022 had a percentage of 163. Now in these last three games of the season, they have a percentage of 32 percent complete polar opposites. You can see they're struggling to score and they are now struggling to also defend. There's a number of theories you could conjure up so I'll rattle off a few here. A lack of continuity sucks, said an old man probably, and that saying could not be any truer with Melbourne's season. In rounds 1 to 10, Melbourne had established a 10-man rotation which saw action in the back line. A part of the ground Melbourne have been known to dominate and be heavily researched by oppositions to try and manipulate ways to score goals. However, in the last three rounds where the losing streak has manifested itself, 12 backline players have been used. That's if you include Mitch Brown into that list, having needed his services up there in times of dire need. An established backline is the best backline, and being on demand in that department or constantly omitting players is unhealthy, yet indicative that their backline is being exposed and found out as their depth is tested. We can also look at the blatantly obvious. The last three games have not been easy matchups in any way. The teams played in rounds 1 through 10 were the Bulldogs, Gold Coast, Essendon, Port Adelaide, GWS, Richmond, Hawthorne, St Kilda, West Coast, and North Melbourne. Believe it or not, at the time of recording this, these opponents hold a 12 and 49 record against the top eight, meaning that tougher opponents usually pick them off. Tougher opponents like Melbourne. However, the three opponents Melbourne have lost to, Fremantle, Collingwood, and Sydney, not only possess records against top eight sides that consist of a winning record, but this is a winning record that combines for 10 wins and six losses, having only two less wins despite having 43, yes, 43 less losses. That indicates that simply put, these opponents being top eight sides themselves are competitive with their surrounding opponents, and the Ds aren't gonna get the win simply handed to them on a platter. There's another theory, and this could be a stretch, but is it possible West Coast and North Melbourne are part of the problem? And here's why. We're tapping into the more psychological side of football. That same old man once said, shitty football clubs can make you complacent, question mark? And I say the question mark because it's not definitive, but Melbourne prior to their losing streak played the two worst teams in the league, both of which they obviously won. But as of recording this, have combined for only two wins in the first 14 game weeks of the season. Or should I say going into the 14th game week of the season. Against North, the following statistics. Pay attention. 23 tackles inside 50, 10 above average, outmarked 111.66, had 17 more clearances, and 40 more inside 50s. Meaning they had extreme ease in locking the footy in their forward line. The mark differential shows North playing safe footy in their back half, and the Ds playing run and gun, intercepting, whilst their insane inside 50 and clearance advantage shows they were winning both the territory advantage and were unanimously in command of the game. Against West Coast, they held 24 more inside 50s, 10 more clearances, and 64 more disposals, basically reinforcing the same idea. But quite possibly, it switched them off, accustomed themselves to a football match that best believe was the complete polar opposite of what they were going to be subjected to against their next three opponents. Simply put, there's a possibility that their standard was lowered to these worst sides. These demolitions possibly gave them false hope to an extent, and when they got hit with some real competition, 
It took them a while to adjust to that standard and thus served as a culture shock. Enough of the theory though. Let's put it into action with the film review. Where we look at in-game footage and see what the hell they're doing wrong. Let's begin with this. We commence with looking at some plays that define Melbourne's blueprint. Your boy's voice is gone so I've been called upon for my services. First play here, kick into the middle, 50-50 contest. One by the D's, Jaden Hunt takes it full stride, and the releasing hand pass shows this image. Toby Bedford has broken clear from the wall of Dockers defenders, with only two one-on-ones ahead of the ball. Great one-handed pick up by him, he's conflicted with two options, go for goal or pass it off. On this occasion it works out. Okay, so next clip, ball thrown in. Doc is hounded with pressure, Brayshaw tries to take on the run, but that perceived pressure the D's create affects him on this occasion, drops the footy, possibly should have given away the free kick, Oliver swoops and Koza Piquet with a clinical finish. Next clip, you see here Moore has the intercept covered. But the D's have a knack of scoring from absolutely nothing, and here is no exception. Now we take a look at these three oppositions throwing the D's game plan right back into their face. Let's begin with the opponent's ability to shithouse goals. Pendlebury bites off a kick into the middle of the ground, Mason Cox isn't the guy you want a part of the link-up chain. Dodgy pass to a 50-50, Elliot does extremely well to make a contest from a bad position, then Elliot the difference maker with a crucial knock-on as he draws a Melbourne player to the footy, Dykos has a huge element of time because of this. If we pause, Ollie Henry looks screwed in terms of positioning, but creates a contest, spoils her bird, and the area the pies look most dangerous can capitalize from here. Lipinski isn't pressured by one Demons player, the rest is history. Here we'll see Nick Blakey take possession at half-back and kick to a contest further forward. Sam Reid, with the awareness to knock the ball towards Papley, McDonald with an interesting disposal of the footy. The quick kick by Golden to a one-on-one, -on -one, sees Heaney outsmart Hunt, and it bounces off his shoulder, for the mark. Not clean by any stretch, but unpredictable to keep Melbourne scrambling. Here's another example. Tussle in the middle of the ground. Ramper puts boot to ball, fortuitously lands right in the lap of Wicks, he has no options, blindly kicks, and McDonald dives for the grab. Turns out if you don't even know what you're doing, best believe the opposition won't either, and that's where this shot came from. Now we look at corridor usage, good entries, and blocking the D's exit from their back 50. First clip Dockers execute a simple switch. If we pause, we can see the D zonal setup, however, if you can identify where D's players are committed to, and your kicks are precise it's easy to get right through it. Chapman's kick has the D scrambling, Clark with the link up, and if we pause here, you can see Lob has snuck in behind, and the D zonal defense is no longer effective. Next, we have Darcy winning a free for his side, Brayshaw with the positive mindset to take advantage. These players at this point, have committed to offense, which means Brayshaw can work hard, get off the leash, and hit lob up with a beautiful lace-out delivery. Next, we have the D's trying to exit their backline, Amadu makes a contest, and then Sam Reid, with a beautiful follow-up tackle, pins the arms, holding the ball. So admirable to see key forwards doing this. What transforms a forward line is little nuancey things like that. Here we have some corridor usage by the Pies, Adams does well to even out a two-on-one, wins the footy, Pies are released, football in the reliable hands of Pendlebury, and whilst the kick doesn't hit the target, it's equally effective than if it did, because the ball hits the deck, and the aerial dominance the Ds have is negated, whilst the impact of the small forwards are heightened. Goal from Ginevan. Another example, simple forward hand pass by Dagoa, even though it doesn't hit the target, it allows Chris to run on, and his kick is exceptionally weighted to allow Mehocek to run full pelt at the footy, and these defenders cannot do their job. Dykos here intercepts the footy at half-back, positive mindset by the rookie to be corridor-centric. Little messy in the corridor. Pies end up with it through Dykos, forward hand pass by Pendlebury sends the Pies off to the races and Dagoa turns on the Jets. Whilst Hubbard does well here to even out a two-on-one, it is hard to fathom, yet emphatically confirms the power of going direct, as in this case, the defenders are outnumbered. 
Cox is at the fall of the ball, Elliot receives the pass and the rest is history. A byproduct of having extra numbers. Dikos again the kickstarter here, receiving the hand pass, having a sense of urgency. Right down the guts. If we pause here, kick doesn't look like it'll come off, could go the other way, 3 on 3. However, a mistime by the debutant, as Cameron moved the play forward. And whilst Adams doesn't hit the target, the corridor usage once again had a player wide open. The ability for the Pies to lock the footy into their forward line through this McCreary tackle is exactly what happens if you take Lever out of his comfort zone, which is intercepting, not trying to fend off and break free from tackles. We have another 50-51 by the Swans at half-back for them, after Gorn has a fresh airy. Warner kicks forward. Stop. We see here, whilst all these players are goal side, that extra number they had is a non-factor. The corridor usage breached the zone. Hunt has had a stinker dealing with Papley in this game, so it's no surprise he gets edged under it and Petty cannot get back in time to stop the goal. End-to-end -end footy at its finest. To bridge from the last clip, we now look at how the Ds have had their hands full with small forwards. Throw in here, you can see whilst Jackson wins the tap, Brody reads the drop to perfection. If we stop at this frame here, you can see Bowie and Sparrow with no direct opponent, meanwhile Soam and Walters are free roaming towards the contest. Bowie does well to pick up a man, but still Soam and Walters are free at the back of the stoppage. It's a raffle, they are still free, and who would have thought? Walters snaps a goal after being free for 10 years. We see Griffin Logue with the ball here. You can see right in the corner of your screen, Blake Akers is there. You can see how far away he is from the contest. Schultz looks done for in this contest. Yet, your favorite comic book superhero with the golden fist. Evens out the contest from absolutely nowhere, and Schultz can run into an open goal. At the very least, there should have been communication for someone to watch Schultz and stay down. The game's pretty much over at this point, but this sums up the game really. High kick, you see Oliver side by side with Schultz. Oliver gambles front and center, whilst Schultz looks to take on the run, and Oliver's gamble falls short. Goal, Schultz. And now we look at the Ds being straight done, and welcoming pressure they don't need. This one's more psychological, they need 5 goals in 9 minutes. Big Sam tries a kick into the middle, doesn't pay off. And the Dockers find Collier down the line. Goal from this set shot, seals the win. Here, Oliver takes a good intercept grab, and looks to keep the play moving, however, Sparrow inexplicably misses the handball in the middle of the ground by mere inches, sends Sydney the other way, Lever inexplicably drops an uncontested mark. And now pause. Salem finds himself on Amadi, Tomlinson is terribly outpositioned, and has no impact whatsoever. Hunt and Tomlinson look for the bailout hand pass at the back of the stoppage, but neither communicated who would remain on Papley. He holds his run, there's enough time for a handball, and as a result the attention he brings leaves McDonald unaccounted for, for a snap on goal, which he converts. Here, what do you reckon happens? No communication, Mitch Brown or Lever. In a terrible passage for Brown, he lets down a beautiful peripheral vision handball by Salem, and passes to Bowie as if he's seven feet tall. The second handball by Brown in the sequence is loopy, Hibbert is rushed. The kick is shallow and turned over. Adams with a pass to a wide open Mihocek. Completely avoidable if those fundamentals were executed. Here, the Ds are trying to exit the back 50. They've had goals kicked on them. They need to take the heat out of the game, slow the momentum. Hans should have an easy mark here. Instead, Sparrow with a brain-dead play to die for a heroic mark, drops the footy, Jordan has to rush the kick clear to a 2-on-1. Cox was everywhere in this game. He gets it to the trusty hands of Pendlebury. He precisely passes to Hoskin Elliott. Here, you see the power of simply marking the footy. Pendlebury had time to survey his options, didn't have to rush, and executed well. Something the Ds could have done if they weren't screwed over by low IQ. You can see there's a field of space in the middle of the 50, where you have the best chance of scoring from a set shot and Ollie Henry identifies this, leads into the space, mark. Given the pies have been relentless, Ds players remain attached to their players, meaning that zone defense is void. If we pause here, Bowie should in theory have a world of time to dispose of the footy accurately. 
Instead, the handball lacks connection and doesn't hit the target. It severely disadvantages Rivers, three Dockers Smalls converge, so in this case, Rivers should have eyed a dead ball. Instead with guilt, he tries to toe poke instead of putting his head over the ball, Frederick thrusts the ball forward. Petty should have just booted the ball here, instead he admits Brayshaw into trouble as he is placed under severe pressure, hand pass is errant, Dockers are like a freight train, get out of the way. The pass is to Collier's left, but the contrast in IQ is really shown in this one sequence, with Frederick's knock-on more artistic than the Mona Lisa. Schultz with the goal, but completely avoidable, if that hand pass was simply not errant. Thanks friends, we're done here with the film review, back to you. Thanks for that. So after watching film, here's what we can extract. The two main takeaways, which are that Melbourne are welcoming shit, and oppositions are making room for goodness, complemented by the smaller takeaways, which are the fact that small forwards give the Ds the jitters, especially when there's a ground ball up for grabs. You have to attack the corridor against Melbourne. You have to block Melbourne from exiting the arc. Melbourne shit themselves if you give them a reason to, and sometimes shithousing goals are the best goals. Looking ahead, Melbourne will exit the bye having to play a really defining fixture against Brisbane. No Max Gorn for the best part of a month, so that beautiful tap work of his and his all-round impact around the ground will be missed. Let's see who steps up for them. Plenty of capable players. They've won the Premiership for a reason, and there's no doubt that Melbourne will escape this minor hiccup. But when this season is all said and done, will we be looking back on this three-week stint as a possible difference maker in how the D season ultimately panned out? Show your support if you enjoyed this one, and I'll see you next time. Peace out.